Good morning. It is the Lord's Day, and it is the 24th day, or I should see the 28th day of, of April 2024. Our theme today is submission. I'd like to read our scripture taken from Hebrews 13, 17 through 19. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you sooner. When we think of submission, I think of the fact that Jesus went to his disciples and said, come, follow me. Following is submitting to the will of someone else who is determining your direction, your path, and your speed. By the way, I'm going to have a cast on my right foot like I had on my left foot a couple years ago. And I don't think I'll be able to drive. My wife will drive me around. I just hate that thought because I will be submitting to her in her timing, her direction, and everything. Submission is really hard. Some people say, I follow God and not men. Everybody in this whole earth and every pastor needs someone to be accountable to. Submission to leadership is the measure of true submission to God. Submission is the essence of discipleship and failure of leaders is not a reason for non-submission unless you're proud and arrogant. Some of you say, well, leaders fail, so I'm not going to submit. That's not a reason. But here's one of the most important things that prerequisite to leadership is mastering submission or following. And I've met so many people who are rebellious and they want to be in charge, they want to be leaders, and they could never be leaders because they don't know how to follow. So as we look at this subject, we start first with the pursuit of Christ. Verse 17a says, obey your leaders and submit to them. If you're going to pursue Christ and follow him, it will come through following your earthly leaders. Let's look at some scriptures. Psalm 100 says, know that he is God. It is he who made us and we are his people and we are the sheep of his pastures. Yes, we are his sheep. Then John 10, 14 says, I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me. And John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. In fact, the shepherds on cold and, and stormy nights would gather their sheep into the sheepfold, and sometimes two, three shepherds would pull into the same sheepfold, build their fire in the front, but in the morning when they left, each shepherd went out his direction and gave their call, and the sheep knew who their shepherd was, and they broke up into their separate herds. And it seems to be theologically, and this important thing is our identity and our following is very important. They were his sheep, and people knew they were his sheep because they followed him and people will know you are the sheep of the Lord because you follow. If you spend your life saying, I'm not following a human authority, like one guy who once uh, came to church to visit, he said, I don't belong to anybody or any church. And I, I couldn't believe that. And he went down the road to another church, and the pastor said, well, we don't want you either. Well, whatever. Submission and human authority is very important. What are the limits of human authority? How much authority should a human being have? Well, there are three things that limit human authority. Number one is the Bible. But unfortunately, as we read the Bible, it has various different views and principles about human authority, but it doesn't always limit it. The second thing we have, which is probably very important, is 
uh, constituted authority, and that means we as a church get together and write our bylaws, and we give authority to certain positions as described, and that is okay to do. The third thing is earned authority. When you approved yourself as a leader, then you earn authority for people to follow you. And it is also, there are people, I feel I'm a proven leader, and I think there are people in our church who are proven followers because in as much as they trust me, I trust them. Boundaries and fences are comforting. But here is a problem, and I've been in this in my ministry over the years, when everybody starts questioning who has a right to do what. And authority is questioned. I tell you, it gets ugly when authority is questioned. But here's what the scripture says. You who are younger, subject to your elders. Clothe yourself in humility one to the other, for God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And remember, we do have a cheap shepherd. It says when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. The second thing we find in our text is the pastor protector, and it speaks of the pastor as saying, they keep watch over your souls. The watchful pastor first watches over souls, and we watch and pray. And one of the things we watch for is to avoid confrontation. Some people love confrontation, but sometimes avoiding conf confrontation is just fine. You see someone, and they're growing in the Lord, and they're struggling, and they're learning on their own, and you see some very concerning things in their life. You continue to pray for them, and also pray that it never gets to the place where you have to put the hammer down on them, because if you do, very likely your ministry with that person will be ended because very few people are so humble that they handle that sort of thing. When I have to put the hammer down on someone, once I decide I'm going to have to, I spend another week of prayer to make an effective confrontation because when you're confronting people's sin, that sin it is usually very ingrained in their life and they don't know any better because it's just so much a part of their life and they are very challenged if you bring it up. So the best thing to do is to avoid it and let them grow. Why do we have people in our world that leave churches and go to other churches? Sometimes I look at people and go, well, I'll go as far as I can with them and we'll see what happens. Sometimes I took them as far as I could and then I couldn't avoid the confrontation, so they went somewhere else. And God is working with them through all the way. But we have to do what we have to do. Now, the effective, watchful pastor watches over a flock as a whole to see where they're going. He watches for wolves. Those are people who come in to the flock and cause problems. I had a friend of mine, he is now in heaven, but he was a pastor, and when someone new came into his church, and he had a good-sized church, he ran every one of them through a security check to see what their background was. There's a few times that would have been wise and safer, and it would have saved me some money as a church if we had but I'm not sure I want to live that kind of life to do that kind of thing. But sometimes it's not a bad idea. I had one man that came into the church a few years back, and he seemed very nice at first, and then he got to where he questioned things, and he began criticizing things I was preaching, and I would explain to him why, and he'd thank me, and then three days later send me these horrible text messages and and accuse me of terrible things. And finally, after a couple months of this, I finally asked him never to come back. So he left and went to another church. And after a few months, the pastor called me and said, he said to him, get away from me, Satan, is what the pastor said to him. 
And I don't know. I feel sorry for guys like that. We have to watch in the church for worldliness, and worldliness is sneaky ways of coming in. We wa need to watch the new movements. There are always new movements. And first, coming to understand them. Uh, I had a uh, pastor in my pastor's fellowship who was working on a doctorate degree. And while he was working on his doctorate degree, his professors were teaching them all the latest things in new movements in the evangelical church. And he would come to our pastor's group and spend a day teaching us these new movements. It was so good because I went to a national seminar and somebody asked a speaker who was a nationally known speaker about the new movement. He didn't know anything about it. I did. But that was a movement that didn't last very long. It lasts six or eight, ten years and kind of faded away. But there are some new movements that just take 50, 60 years for the church to get over. Now, it's interesting. This one new movement is one where you experience things. You take out the pews and put round tables for people to sit at and couches. And I know at least two churches that hit the dust over that, that were going well. Well, then we have to look for evangelistic opportunities all the time. We have to look at, look at new threats. And quite frankly, sometimes I go to district meetings and they have lawyers there telling us about new threats. One of the biggest threats to the evangelical church today is some of the things that have to do with this uh, uh, people changing their sexuality and then wanting to use the women's bathroom. If you want to get the women in the church excited and worked up, have a man go in the woman's bathroom. That'll do it every time. And by the way, right now, the administration is trying to change Title IX, and they want it to where all the bathrooms in the, all the schools nationwide are available to anybody who wants to use it in whatever way they want. If I were building a new church today, I would never put a women's and a men's bathroom in. I would just put in a bunch of single holders for one person. They'd call them all family bathrooms. And uh, I would put about six or eight of them in and not a women's bathroom, not a men's bathroom. We'd never have a problem. That is the way to do things today. Well, the discerning pastor also has to see pastor wannabes. And there are these people everywhere you go who want to be a preacher. And they do a funeral here and there, and maybe they do a wedding here and there, and they fill in in the different places, and they think they're just the hottest stuff ever. But we call them shade tree preachers because they have never been in the heat of the battle, but they know it all. And some of them, sometimes you just wish you could shut them up. They create more problems. Well, the wise pastor has to sort all of these things out and try to figure out how to react to them without creating more trouble than you already have. And uh, that is my job. I remember as a teenager, we had a very wise pastor, and I would go to him and tell him my latest idea, and he'd kind of screw up his face and say, well, <sighs> he knew better than my latest idea, but he didn't want to discourage me too bad. It's hard. It's hard because people sometimes have said, every time I'm for something, you're against it. <laughs> can be true because we're watching, protecting the game. Third thing is potential punishment. And it says about the pastor as those who will have to give an account. Giving account require, implies punishment, that pastors could be punished. You remember the guy who got the one talent, the guy who got the four talents, the guy who got the ten talents, and they were sort of punished and rewarded for how they used their talents. Well, 
We get punished sometimes in the church for our weaknesses. And the scripture says in James 3, 5, and 6, the tongue is a small member and yet a boast of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such small fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. I want to say this, that when these hard times come in the church, it brings out the worst in the pastor. And I would like to say, this is this is funny. I mean, I, I believe in funerals. I think everybody should have one, but part of me doesn't want to have a funeral. There's been so much said. You cannot you cannot pastor the same church for 31 years without having a group of people out there that think you're tell, terrible. I've had people tell me to the face to my face that I am the devil. Sometimes I, there's been so much said, I just like, when I die, just bury me and don't say nothing because there's been too much said already. I just want to leave it alone. Sometimes I feel like that. However, that's probably not uh, the right thing. Probably need to do a funeral because I guess all old soldiers have enemies that don't like them. In this life, we get punished. James 3.1 tells us that not many of you should become teachers, my brethren, for you know that we who teach are judged with a greater strictness, which means we ought to know more, but we're just people and we don't necessarily. We are also judged in eternity. The scripture says in Ezekiel chapter 3.16, Son of man, I made you a watchman for the house of Israel. When you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me, saying, If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and give him no warning, nor speak the warn to the wicked about his wicked ways in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I'll require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his ways or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Sometimes the hardest weight of ministry is how to deal with all this responsibility and all of these things and, the, and know how to live with the weight of it. Some of the accountability issues are truth and honesty. You know, there are people who do ministry and do wonderful things, but they do it in dishonest ways. They want to hide certain things, or they want to do the things that bring people in, and then it's called bait-and-switch type of advertising. Well, that's not ethical. We have to keep accountable in marriage, not only our own marriages, but the marriages that we promote and we do. We have to keep honorable and accountable in doctrine. We have to be accountable in evangelism. We have to be accountable in sin. We have to be accountable with God's word. I struggled a lot when I was young with the issue of the inerrancy of scripture and the different stands that were taken. There are many things to sort out and punish or, and understand, and we can be punished for our ability. The third thing is I want to talk about, the fourth thing is pleasant ministry. Let them do this with joy and not groaning. That would not be an advantage to you. Paul said in Philippians 1, 1 and 2, or Philippians 4, 1 and 2, and I, I have to laugh. This I sometimes find this humorous. I hope you understand this. Paul basically said to them, you Philippian people are by joy and crown. He was so happy with them. And then the next verse is this where the humorous part. He turns to two ladies named Eudora and Syntyche and says, I wish you two would get along and quit fighting. <laughs> well, maybe that's just part of ministry. But I would like to give this congregation, Riverview Alliance, a personal thanks for joyous, many joyous years of ministry. Now, 
It hasn't always been joyous here. There was about five years here, about 15 years ago, where it seemed like about half the congregation wanted to hang my head, and they were, there was some terrible things said, some terrible things done. And uh, it, it was, there have been times like that. These are dark periods. These dark periods bring brokenness, and sometimes they bring godliness, and sometimes they bring bitterness. Everybody has some bitterness, but eventually you got to get over that. I have a friend currently who, I have two friends, one who, he's not bitter, he's not angry, but he's been at his church a long time, he's respected in the congregation, but he's got such a group of radical boneheads in his leadership that he just said, I'm moving on, and he left them, and one of the problems we have is what are we going to do with them? after he's gone. That's one of the problems. We have another pastor, friend of mine, who is broken, and at this point he is bitter, and we hope that changes. Now, the scripture says that it is of advantage to the church for the pastor to have joy in ministry, because, number one, growth does not sustain during division. Number two, the pastor is most effective in years of joyous ministry. And number three is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It would abide these three things, faith, hope, and love, and love is the most contagious. Now, long-term pastoral ministries are most effective. They say until your sixth year, you really don't accomplish a lot. Now, the last thing I'd like to speak about today is prayer for the pastor. There is a call to prayer. It, he says, please pray for us. And then he says, I am sure I have a clear conscience. Well, years ago, over 40 years ago, I saw a bumper sticker that just stuck in my mind. It said, let your conscience be your guide. And then they had a big red X over conscience, and they wrote Bible on top of that. You know, it's true, our consciences are not necessarily correct, but we think we're right. Jeremiah 17 said, The heart is deceitful above all things and extremely desperately sick. Who can understand it? Sometimes we as pastors need a humble eye opening. And I, I have one friend who's in bitterness, and he needs an eye opening, but he can't see it yet. He's stuck in arrogance and anger. Secondly, Paul said we have act honorable. Well, it's hard to act honorable when you are bitter. Let me just say this. My greatest mistake in ministry has not been the decisions I made. I've looked back and there isn't a decision hardly that I wouldn't make the same way again because I made it with consultation with very godly people in leadership and and such. But some of the decisions I made that were wrong was to be bitter and angry and fight back with people who were out of line. I should have never fought with them, and I should have forgiven them immediately. And I also had a revenge and a desire to be justified. You know, I feel sorry for our ex-president and maybe again President Donald Trump. He has a lot of redeeming qualities, but the thing that is that that is his worst enemy is his bitterness, his unforgiveness, and his desire for justification and revenge. That is what hurts him more than anything else, and I don't know if he's ever going to learn that. But it is clear what happened. And he has lots of reasons to be bitter and lots of reasons for revenge. A lot of people that did terrible things to him. But you know what? All of that doesn't make you be a president better. <sighs> now, Paul's desire was to be restored to these people. And we don't know why he wasn't restored. Perhaps he had a physical challenge. Perhaps he was in prison. Or 
the devil had some kind of spider web written to keep Paul from coming. This is a call for earnest prayer, for the things you didn't see coming. And some days you wake up and you're encountering something you never ever dreamed would happen before. And then for 2 Thessalonians 3, 2 says, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of God may speed ahead, be honored as happened among you, that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. I like the old King James. It says, from unreasonable and evil men. I have met some Christians who are as unreasonable as you can get. And you can not You can tell them the truth. You can tell them what it right is, and it goes nowhere. And that's very, very, very difficult. Well, as we look at our scripture today, it's about submission. And it's interesting, the scripture is about submission, but it speaks more to the pastor's situation. So if you want to pursue submission, you need to obey the leaders God puts over you. You need to understand that pastor is there to protect you, and he can be potentially punished for not doing right. And that it's a joy for you and him for to give him a pleasant ministry and keep praying for that pastor. In conclusion, here is the scripture I want to give you. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 and 21. Submitting to one another out of the reverence for Christ. May we learn to submit to one another to submit within our families, and to submit to the Lord, and submit to the human leaders God has given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, help us to be submissive. Break our spirits, our pride, our hearts, and teach us to humbly follow. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.